Our keynote speaker really needs no introduction. I mean, I think a lot of the, uh, you know John and probably spoken with him personally. Um, I got to meet him last week, and interestingly enough, he was here in Raleigh uh, speaking at a local DevOps meetup. Uh, but he didn't stay over the weekend, so that's all right. <laughs> but anyway, um, should really enjoy his talk. So everybody, it's John Wills. Hey, <laughs> greetings. Are we live with the, yeah, I can hear the live mic. All right, hey, uh, greetings everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. I am a huge, huge fan of internal DevOps days. Uh, it's something that actually started about three years ago. First one I ever saw was at ING, the bank in Europe, and I was invited there. Now, a lot of enterprises are doing it. Um, I think um, large commercial deliverers, I don't see a lot of companies doing what you're doing. I mean, a lot, you know, I could name a handful of large customers that are doing this. So I totally applaud what you guys are doing here, you guys are guests. So anyway, um, what I'm going to do is, this is a presentation I gave at Chicago DevOps Days about three weeks ago, the keynote there. I thought it was really relevant for, um, I, I do a lot of keynotes, um, a lot of DevOps Days I do the keynotes. And um, the, um, typically they say do a keynote and I just do whatever I want, right? I talk about immutable delivery or some theme-based presentation, but this time they were like, John, I really want you to stick to the theme of a state of use. So I actually had to do a little bit of work. Um, not that my other presentations aren't work, but, uh, so, but it was fun because it actually level set some of the things I really hadn't really thought through. And I thought this would be a really good presentation for you all because uh, you'll see based on my background and all this why my rambling right now might make sense. I actually work for Docker. I'll explain that here in this slide. My Twitter handle is uh, botchgaloop. It's typically a very difficult um, one to capture when I'm only going to cover the slide for about 30, 40 seconds. Um, I did actually make an alias, but that never seems to work. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, if you go there, the, the point of the whole Twitter thing is that's where I communicate to 90% of the people on the planet that I communicate with. And so it, if you have any questions or you want to contact me, after, I'll be around for a little while. I may actually stay the rest of the day. Um, I love open spaces too. So, um, but that's the place to get me, because that's where I listen. When you put Bachikaloop in a Twitter handle and ask me a question, I'll 98% chance I'm going to answer that question or get you to the right place. Um, 35 years in IT, that's not me. Um, I don't have any prizes to give anybody. If, unless, if you already know the answer, don't shout it out. Who's that picture? Deming. All right. Yes, Deming, yes, it's Deming. I, I'm a big fan of Deming. Actually, I've changed the icon recently on a dare, but... Another story for another day. Um, I started my career at Exxon. I, I'm an IT operations junkie. I love operations. Other than my kids and my wife, that's pretty much all I think about. Uh, maybe sports, college football. But um, I really, really love large infrastructure, thinking about how we do this thing. I've been doing it for years. I started out as a mainframe assembler program. Or I actually did Tivoli for about 10 or 15 years. I have scars up and down my legs. Um, the, I, I, I love infrastructure, and today I'm with Docker. Um, I've, um, I was early in at Chef. I was like the ninth person in at Ops Code Chef. Um, I thought what they were doing and Adam Jacob was just everything that had been pre-written for me to do. Um, actually, now I think that's Docker, but, uh, but um, I had a company that I was a principal with called Stratius. It was a multi-cloud management solution. We sold that to Dell. And then about seven months ago, I did a startup that didn't last too long. We got acquired by Docker. Um, it was SDN and Docker, more specifically Open vSwitch. So we can talk more about that later if you want. I'm, I was the only American at the original DevOps days in Ghent, which was six years ago. I brought the first DevOps days to the US. And I'm not bragging. I want to give you some context of why the next couple of slides will hopefully make sense. Um, and uh, so I've been heavily involved in this thing called DevOps, because that, to me, again, was another one of these, uh, this is where I was supposed to be for the last 30 years. Um, and, um, and I do a DevOps Cafe, iTunes. We, um, we interview some amazing people on that podcast. I mean, some of the people I'm going to talk about in this presentation, uh, there are people who blow your mind. I mean, Sidney Decker, if you've ever heard of him, or Adrian Krakow, who I, mean, I can just go down the list of these people that we've gotten on our show that, um, that are just, in fact, we had Mary and Tom Popnick 
on, if you know who those people are, right? We had them on our show. We got, yeah, so it's, it's, it really, I mean, I, we don't sell anything. We don't make any money off it. It's a labor of love. So the agenda this morning, so I thought about, like, well, okay, if I have to go ahead and, and do a State of the Union, what are the important things? And so, um, so I think taxonomies have been interesting, and I'll, I'll talk about something called CAMS and more recently something called ICE. Um, there is a, a DevOps survey. I, I work very closely with Gene Kim. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. I'm a co-organizer um, for the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Um, I actually worked pretty hard on the uh, Phoenix Project book we'll talk about a little bit. I, I'm not an author, but some of the principles in it were um, derived by me and another gentleman named Patrick Dubois. Um, but I've been involved in the DevOps survey to a certain extent, too. In fact, all the network questions on this year's were mine. So if any of you took the survey, the 2015 survey, I contributed all the network. They, weren't, they didn't accept a whole lot. But, um, but we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about DevOps in the enterprise, uh, what's going on. Um, it's pretty interesting. And then um, I just joke, oh, yeah, technology if we have time. <laughs> right? This is not a technology presentation. Um, so um, I told you that I was at Ghent. I was the only American at Ghent. I was a, there was 40 people at the DevOps days in Ghent. Patrick Gabar is the person we consider the godfather of DevOps. Um, we decided to try to run a first US-based one in Silicon Valley at LinkedIn, actually, uh, piggybacking the Velocity, um, O'Reilly, the O'Reilly Velocity Conference. We had 300 people in that first one. This was 2010. It was insane. That 40-person one was insane. Multiply that by 10, because you had 300 people that were just the, the excitement that you, you all are pr like probably experience right now if this is your first DevOps days, and when you get through the open spaces, imagine that as like nobody's seen this before. Nobody's even, nobody in the room has ever experienced this, right? It was that kind of experience. And so me and Damon, who do the podcast, we literally decided to have no guests that week, and we would just basically talk about it, and we accidentally came up with a taxonomy for DevOps, and it's reasonably, it's stuck reasonably. I say it's a loose taxonomy. It was never intended to be in a taxonomy. People call it CAMS, Cultural Automation Measurement Sharing. Over the years, we've had like side effects of it, like if, if you know, it don't, um, CAMS, not AMS. If you're not doing a culture, forget about the AMS. Uh, I was at Target uh, about three weeks ago, well, about six weeks ago now, but, um, and there, I'll talk about them later, but, they, uh, they, they call it a, um, a, a culture and sharing sandwich, right? Um, and so it was funny. You know, we were really just trying to get our own brain around it. Anyway, so that stuck over the years. We did that in 2010. And um, I wrote this blog article when I was at Chef. It's kind of fun. You know, I still see people like, hey, I've heard about this DevOps thing. And you'll see a tweet where somebody retweets that our, uh, post. It was like my explanation of what CAMS is on, on the... You know, what DevOps sees to me, Google it if you're interested. It, it's it's kind of stood the test of time. Test of time. In this world, time is like, you know, two years is like crazy time, right? Like you know, the way things have changed. Even in six months, what's happened with technology, you know? Um, you know, say Lord Kubernetes. Um, anyway, um, but here's the thing. When I went ahead and started thinking about the Chicago DevOps days, I, um, I started thinking about like CAMs. And one of the things I've been really thinking a lot about, and, and, and it's all because if I sound smart, it's because I've got really smart friends. And really smart friends that are willing to listen to me and let me talk, right? That's the second key there, right? Um, and, and what I think I've learned a lot over the last, say, two and a half, three years, let's say three years, you know, about complexity, about feedback loops. I think a lot about this now, and I think about a lot about how it applies to just operational infrastructure, um, and, and so I, I thought about CAMS, and I thought, you know what? Me and Damon missed the point. It really was a feedback loop from day one. We just didn't realize it. That, that the culture, and, and here's the other thing, right? We talk about continuous delivery, continuous improvement, and, and those are really awesome things. And I thought about, well, actually, culture is continuous improvement, right? Which is something we think a lot about in, in DevOps. Um, culture feeds our automation. The way, you know, if you've ever heard, uh, you know, um, Conway's law, right, that, that applies to everything we do, right? 
Um, and, and how our culture is, is how we deliver automation. And automation is a broad stroke term these days. What's service delivery? It's code, it's infrastructure, it's this, it's that. It's containers, it's virtualization, it's ACI, whatever, right? It's a lot of stuff, right? So your culture feeds that, whether you like it or not. And then um, measurement, this is pure Deming, but, but what, what I've learned really is it's all about measuring and looking at results and making decisions about re results. Deming called it PDSA. Um, it's, you know, in seventh grade, we learn it in science called scientific method. Right, so our measurement basically comes, and our sharing is basically output of those experiments. And that feeds right back into culture, which becomes, uh, in general, a cybernetic feedback loop. So that's been our CAMS. Um, Jez Humble, who wrote um, Kinder's delivery book, called it CLAMS for a while, adding lean into the, or comms, whichever way you want to mix the characters. Um, I took it back out. I, for, year, for a while, I, I used it, but I thought lean is really just an umbrella to all of this. So I didn't think it fit in the uh, acronym, actually. But um, my good friend Dave Zwiebrak basically wrote this blog article a while back. Um, I mean, a while back, like a year and a half, two years ago. I don't have my speaker notes, so I can't, like, bet a date. So I now have to guess on the dates. But it's no more. It's less than two it's probably a year. He had this blog article on OI really called ICE, and DevOps is really ICE. And, um, you know, keep it cool at ICE, right? But, and, and, what do you, and, and, and this is another kind of aha. Hey, John, you got to write a, um, a State of Union. What do you think about? And then, you know, actually, I sent out to about 40 people. I said, hey, I'm going to do the State of Union. Can you give me three top things, DevOps? And about 15 people replied. And Dave was one, and he reminded me of this blog post. And I'm like, yes. And so uh, I like this acronym as a sideline to CAMS in that we think about DevOps now in, in terms of inclusivity, complexity, and empathy. And so um, do not make fun of that slide. Nobody? Good. I'm learning R right now. And that's my attempt, my first complicated graph where I had to normalize data from both sides. So anyway, so I, can't, I, I will not accept anybody making fun of that slide. But, um, so when we think about occlusion, so the ICE, the I, and it, it, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, one is, if you look at, um, you know, in 2009 there was one DevOps days, and in 2010 there were like two, and then it really, uh, you, you, you notice it goes up. Um, this year, uh, external, not internal, there's 25 DevOps days, right? So it's all around the world. You can't get past a month where there's not a DevOps days going on. Um, a lot of people involved now. And in fact, what's interesting is at um, early days of DevOps days, like 2011, um, you, you know, even going into 2012, if you ask the audience how many people is their first DevOps days, you get less than a third. Now, if you, uh, if you guys are in Chicago, and it, it's consistent now, 80% of the people say it's their first time DevOps. Like, we are bringing in a lot more people to this discussion, right? Um, and then, um, so, and then on the right-hand side, um, the DevOps survey, which I'm going to cover a little later, which has been a, a joint thing from Puppet Labs and, and the uh, Gene's uh, IT revolution, which I'm part of. Um, basically, in um, 2013, um, there was just a really small number. I think it was seven or 800. Um, and then, but in 2014, I thought it was the first, it's actually the fourth year. Uh, for 2014, well, I thought it was the real numbers because they got about 10,000 respondents. And then this year, we had 20,000 respondents, right? So we're getting some really good data. Uh, again, it's all about inclusion. Um, in DevOps days, um, uh, last year was the first time we put a code of conduct on DevOps days. It's a big deal, right? Like, um, I mean, I look at this room right now, and I think about the diversity, right? I just know not, an, not a complaint, not a, a, a negative judgment. But, but we want to, like, let's face it, a lot of us, such as me, I'm an old guy. I'm a geek. I, I, have a, I think I have a good sense of humor, and I'm a geek, and that's a dangerous combo for diversity, <laughs> right? Um, so anyway, so again, I think as you think about this, how do you increase the diversity of this room next year? We took an active, we went actively tried to fix this in DevOps days. Not that it's a problem. It's a better thing. Um, the enterprise, I'll talk about that later. I'll talk about security and network here in a minute. Um, if you haven't heard about rugged software, this is really interesting. 
Um, so um, Gene says, Gene Kim says that, how many people know who Gene Kim is? Okay, all right, all right. Well, so that a lot of this Gene's name dropping is not really working. Um, the, uh, <laughs> so we'll get to Gene in a minute. But he's a good friend. He, he's written a book called The Phoenix Project, which I highly recommend, and we'll talk about it a little, little bit. But um, Gene was very skeptical of DevOps initially. And he, he says that um, I'm the one that kind of convinced him it wasn't a sham. What's cool about Gene is he's one of these mavens, right? Like, he, he interacts in lots of different groups. And one of the groups he's heavily involved is the security group, the, the kind of uh, DEF CON and the, the RSA type people. And he convinced those people, one in, gentleman in particular, um, Josh Corman, that it wasn't a sham. And then Dev and the, the security group got into this in a big way. Um, they created a sub-project called Rugged Software. It's about including security knowledge and expertise done by pure security experts into the flow of this delivery thing we call DevOps. It's really cool stuff. I definitely recommend following some of these people. Um, they have a Rugged Manifesto. I won't read it, but the, the one uh, kind of core part there is I recognize my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical and economic and national security. They're serious security people that are serious about DevOps. Love it. And they have a, there's a project from a friend of mine. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there, but um, I like it when there's one person struggling to build a project that basically makes no money off it and tries to help the world. It's called Gauntlet. uses Cucumber to actually allow you to do um, integration testing and behavior-driven testing for security things. Like you can actually, you can look for heart bleed or things like that inside your continuous integration to your delivery flow. And um, so this Josh Corman character, Josh Corman, um, he's really in light. Over the last year, I've gotten to know him pretty well. And he, um, it, 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 interesting, it's not just security as we think of security. Josh talks about um, another um, kind of Deming principle um, a book called Toyota Supply Chain Management. And, and, and I'll tell you, I th I, for the longest time, I thought, I, I love Deming, and I, 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 I've studied a fair amount about Deming. Um, but the one point I never really agreed with Deming on is the supply, the, what his thoughts about supply chain, until I met Josh Corman. Because Deming will say, have one supplier. When I'm like, eh, one supplier. <laughs> I lived that uh, many years ago. Um, you know, and, and, but what Josh has interpreted this as, from solving an open source problem. You write 30 lines of code today, and you think you have 30 lines of code, you actually probably have a million lines of code, depending on what you selected. And if you don't understand the provenance of that, right, like who knows, like that's how we get into heart bleed and why we get into shell shock and those things and, and it become a disaster. And I think a lot about this because I love immutable delivery and I like Docker and I'll talk a little bit about that later, it's even worse when you're handing around uh, these black box artifacts that are binaries across the whole process. So he talks a lot about from this, um, you know, how do you build a bill of material? How do you think about suppliers? And so I think Google is a good model for this, right? Like if you're going to use an open source logging framework, pick one. If you're going to never have more variants than maybe two releases. Right? Um, if you're going to build a mutable infrastructure, if that doesn't make sense, I'll explain it later, then go ahead and um, think about um, provenance. And um, I saw this thing yesterday. I was at an IBM thing yesterday. They have this blue mix thing, which, you know, interesting. They actually, during the continuous integration flow, this is not hard to do, and they're open, it's already open source. They actually will go ahead and run against, the, among other things, but run against the NIST uh, vulnerability database during your integration process to see if there are known any uh, CVEs as part of that process. That's what Josh is talking about, right? Josh works at Sonotype. Um, he, the, the story that he built is around uh, Toyota versus um, the, um, the Vault. Not as interesting as, um, one more meta point though. Josh turned me on to this. The Verizon every year does a, um, a vulnerability report. And in, in 2014, 97% of all compromises were due to 10 CVEs. So CVEs are, are I forget the acronym stands, but their vulnerability definitions by NIST, right? National Institute of Standards Technology um, by the government. 
97 were known by 10 known CVEs. Like everybody knew what these was. Here's the kicker. Eight of them were older 10 years old. Well, there you go, right? And you know, it's funny. I was the other, uh, about a week ago, I don't know how much time I'm going to want to have using there. I'm watching uh, uh, 60 Minutes, and they're talking about the Chinese, and I got some security expert, and, and he's explaining all this. And I'm thinking, I listen to Josh, and he says, you know, I don't worry about the Chinese. Like, let, let's fix that problem, and then let's start working about other compromises, right? So uh, the reason I point this out, um, I I'm, I'm, I'm really think the inclusion of what people like Josh Carman, James Wickett, who is the author of Gauntlet, there's a whole slew of gene of people that are really thinking about DevOps in the right way in an area that brings in a wealth of knowledge into this fold. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is just one of many, right? Toyota's been, I mean, the truth of the matter is DevOps actually comes from Toyota Parks and Systems. I do a Deming to DevOps presentation that I, I, I actually show the lineage of exactly how this, this plays out. Yeah. Less in-house production. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, because, yeah, I mean, it, it, again, I, I, I'll say this. I, I use this as more of a, um, a driver as I think about open source. So, so I think that's the core model. I, in general, there are things on that that I don't necessarily believe are true, and it's a, a core thing I've always kind of disagreed with Deming on. But when you start thinking about this from an open source and how you do that, then I think uh, those principles to kind of glare. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I've been tempted to remove this slide and just show the Toyota production system, but it's, it's Josh's slide, so it's more like giving him credit. Um, this is an interesting, um, I worked for Chef, and my CEO at the time was uh, Jesse Robbins. He, prior to Chef, he was, his title, he ran all commercial properties in Amazon, and not Amazon Web Services, the, the book, the TV, the, the, the stuff that you buy from them, and his title was called Master of Disaster. That was his title there, right? And he did this thing, uh, I think it's back in, oh, 2007, called The Tale of Two Startups. And, um, and, and actually what he pointed out, and he didn't use this word, is kind of this horizontalization effect that you get when you think about a certain delivery, and this was really a precursor to things like Chef and Puppet, of if you take the company on the left, and don't get caught up on the numbers. Uh, Jesse does a lot of things <laughs> where he doesn't <laughs> do the math, but, but the concept <laughs> is, um, is, is correct. Like the, the, the startup on the left really doesn't spend a lot of time on technical debt. When you think about how you deliver computers, it's about servers, right? It's an article about like a startup's going to have 20 servers by this period of time, and there's one way to do it or the other way to do it. And one way is, at the time, we talked about things like Chef and Puppet. Uh, today, I would talk more about uh, binary artifacts like containers, images and containers. But in general, or immutable delivery, immutable infrastructure, in general, the company on the right that spent a lot of time on the technical debt, the, the cost going out of their config, update, basically OpEx. Right? And we've done, as an industry, whether it's Chef or Puppet, and I will say now there are some phenomenal things going on in terms of uh, mutable delivery, immutable infrastructure models. Uh, we've done, the, our, our industry is like A+. Plus. Anybody want to talk about that industry? The network. So one of my uh, business partners, you know, this is, this is the story. As compute and storage basically go horizontal and even dip on, and I'm not talking about cost of, like, servers and cost of, I'm talking about cost of OPEX and all the other stuff. You know, it drives me nuts. I, I saw a whole bunch of presentations yesterday about OpenStack. These days I'm not a big fan, um, but that's another debate. But every time they show up a slide about the cost versus Amazon, you know, and, 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 and I was being courteous because it was a, a place where they were pro, the conference was pro OpenStack, so I didn't say anything. But I like, I wanted to say, you know, have you included the cost of the people in that? And I know the answer is, right? And, and so I'm not talking about storage and compute. I'm talking about from a network perspective, 
we haven't gone horizontal. Now, I think what you guys, you guys, you girls and guys, men and women, are, have been doing over the last couple of years at Cisco is amazing. You are taking this serious. In fact, we ran, um, is it two years now? We ran the first DevOps for networking, and you were the first sponsor to drive that. Um, so, and there's, but we're not getting the traction that the rugged folk are getting yet. Um, it's still, you know, a little bit harder to, um, that light bulb for the security people, not all of them, a small group, I haven't seen that really blast out in general on the network thing, right? So it's a problem that has to be solved. Right? And I would look at the rugged people really close to solve it, right? Because I'm not a network person. I, I faked one out pretty good to sell a company to Docker. <laughs> Had some smart neck. Uh, you know, I can basically talk SDN, but, but the truth of the matter is it's people in this room that are going to change this. Um, and, you know, this is uh, the changing traffic patterns. You probably all know this. Right? This, this was, uh, so uh, I'll go one more slide. So Brent, uh, Brent Salisbury, Network Static, who's one of my business partners, you know, he talks about, you know, the difference between 1970 and 2014 of, you know, what percentage of traffic was north-south and what percentage is east-west these days. And, you know, we kind of, you know, you can guess all day long, uh, but uh, Facebook did put this out about seven or eight months ago, right? There you go. <laughs> um, you know, machine to machine, I think that's probably 96%, 97%, right? Like, so that's, that changes everything, right? Like, it, like software-defined networking and not the classic definition is a requirement if we need to be able to manage that type of, you know, programmable data paths, all that kind of good stuff, right? Um, anyway. I, I think, you know, I use some of my old slides. I think, uh, I think there becomes this incredible opportunity for containerized compute, which I believe in. I think that is the way of the future, unquestionably. Um, and what does the network look like in a world where um, with thousands of, or hundred, uh, so if you haven't heard some of this, this data, Google says that they run 2.2 billion containers a week. And you say, well, what? Yeah, new. Yeah, they're basically, they're firing up, right? It's a, the, 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 T, the TTL on these things is completely changed. And that's another network problem, right? It's like one thing to say, I'm going to have this many. Like, that's, that's kind of a horizontal problem. <laughs> like, and then, oh, by the way, they're probably all going to last for like four seconds. And the breakup and the day, you know, you got, it changes everything on how you do networking breakdown and set up, right? Um, but here's the thing. You say, well, that's Google, John. Well, uh, I ran into the Yelp people about four months ago at a, a container camp. They say they do 15 containers a second, right? So it's not just a Google unicorn plus story. You know, um, Adrian has some data, Adrian Crocker, in some of his presentations. But I, I don't like the data, no disrespect. I, I, I'm a huge fan of Adrian Krakow. I, I think in the Google world, it's very small, but you're not, they don't deliver that money. Yelp, it, you know, they would say it's probably a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, you, again, the, the, the changing dynamics of, I think some of the numbers that you see, anybody who's publicly presented that, are using skewed number from development environments. So I'm always suspect when I see I'm okay with you know expressing numbers about how many. I'm a little um, cloudy, if you will, on, on the TTL. It, it, well, it becomes, once we get pure data, and we can talk about it from people that actually express the data, it's probably out there, but again, the data I see, I kind of ask immediately, is that a dev? Speaking to Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do we do, boys? Sure. 
Ah. Wow, these guys are good. <laughs> well, no, I can put that one on the rack. You know, it, the, the mileage varies because the size of container, the the because there's two points here. Um, this is my yesterday's presentation, but uh, the so there's two points. Um, um, in general, we could say that a container instantiates in about 500 milliseconds. Um, comparative to a VM, which probably is a minute or two minutes on a good day. But here's the real catch. You start using a different deployment model with containers. So how you converge multiple compute infrastructure. You think about a stack, maybe five or six different computes that have to integrate. If you're using an infrastructure as code model and virtualization, you could easily be at 8, 10, 15 minutes. Um, typically, um, and be careful here because I'm still a stockholder in <laughs> Chef, but, but typically when people move to this kind of immutable delivery model of binary artifacts that are containers, you choose a different method of convergence, typically based on some service discovery model, and literally what would take 8 to 15 minutes typically takes 2 to 3 seconds. That's the real power. When a developer on the last line of code needs to basically rebuild the infrastructure. And the difference is 15 minutes versus three seconds. Or 15 minutes versus three seconds, right? That, the, the context switch there is just enormous. And I could go into the same models in continuous delivery and integration. If you have to rebase an infrastructure and it has to be rebuilt, or you can converge it in three seconds. If you're doing blue-green deploys and delivery, right? Like I can go on again. We'll go way too over the time limit, but uh, hey, I got I'm back at zero. That's awesome. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was at a presentation yesterday. I had 25 minutes to do a slide or deck that was 50 minutes, and I was like, all right, I'll play this silly game. And then the speaker before me went over five minutes, and they tried to take my five minutes. And, uh, and so he threw up the little two-minute sign. I'm like, no way. I said, I am not getting penalized for that last speaker. And I went over. So anyway. We good to go? I'm ready now. Yeah. Sure. That's recovery, folks. All right, so that's inclusion. Now the C, complexity. Um, we did a podcast with Adrian Kyle. How, oh, let me start. How many people have heard of Chaos Monkey? Okay, for those who have not heard of Chaos Monkey, at Netflix, so Netflix believes in resilience, see, resilience engineering. I mentioned Sidney Decker earlier. I'll talk about him in a minute. In fact, the second book in that list. Um, there, there's a model of thinking in DevOps where we think about failure completely different. And it's counterintuitive to most legacy way of thinking. We like to break things. Breaking things are good. And even though uh, nobody's related to Nassib Taleb here, and I, right? When I, before I call him an asshole, um, <laughs> he is an asshole. And the first couple of chapters of uh, his anti-fragile book are pretty reasonably good. Black Swan is a great book. Um, but the point is, I do believe in this concept of an anti-fragile world, and it is so core DevOps, and it so, certainly fits in a complexity model. Um, but here's the thing. So let me go back to Chaos Monkey. At Netflix, they actually have developed some software that purposely kills servers randomly and production servers with no caveats. No, like, ooh, never do this list between three and four. Like, whack, right? And, um, and, and it's a model, and they've expressed that. They call it the Simeon Army. I mean, there's really cool stuff around this. So Google Chaos Monkey, you'll, you'll find more than you've ever wanted to know about it. Um, most DevOps days, you, you say, chaos monkey, everybody knows what you're talking about. Um, but here's the thing. So I had Adrian on our podcast, and I knew the answer, but, you know, you know the whole uh, one thing about podcasting, you can actually, even answers you don't know, you can act like, hey, it's not for me, it's for the audience, right? But um, I asked him, I said, how do you get? I mean, it's obvious you can't just go turn chaos monkey in an infrastructure. Like, that would be a really stupid thing to do, and you'd probably get fired. Um, so you have to get from A to B. And Adrian said, and Adrian Krakow is one of the primary architects of Netflix infrastructure, which I think the Netflix infrastructure is an amazing structure and should be looked at uh, in our industry as 
a model to deliver things at scale and, and understanding complexity. And he said, he said, you know, John, the truth of the matter is the thing I did best at Netflix is I got the right books to the right people. And one of those books is Mike, anybody heard of Mike Nygaard? Right? One of those books is Mike Nygaard's Release It. And one of the chapters in that book, he describes something called circuit breaker patterns. And you have to have, if you're going to do chaos monkey, you better have some model like circuit breaker patterns. And circuit breaker patterns are where you build services. And um, they didn't call them microservices back then when they started this. But you build services um, such that when this part breaks, it's like a circuit breaker and your house doesn't take <laughs> what just happened just now, right? Um, and and so, so that's one of the books he recommended. The second book he recommended is something called Drift Into Failure from Sidney Decker. Fortunately, we had Sidney Decker on a podcast. And Sidney Decker is not an IT person. Sidney Decker is an acad academia. He's basically, he studies failure. His first gig was an airline fatality back in, in South America, an Airbus, um, Airbus whatever, that basically was fully autopilot, that recorrected and went, flew into a mountain. That was his first gig to do the assessment. He was basically just graduating under Dr. Woods at the University of Chicago, another resilience engineering person. And, um, and then he gets called in now like when a baby dies in a hospital because somebody screwed up. Like he, he thinks about failure. So he has a whole slew of books. Um, there's a field guide to um, resilience engineering, there's the drift and safety. Um, a incredibly well thinker. I mean, the easy shortcut is go to John Allspar's at Etsy's <laughs> blog, and you can learn quite a bit there. Um, so all of that um, basically is kind of core principle of thinking about safe failure, being in, uh, think we call it safety engineering, thinking about being in a safe environment for doing things um, for the way Netflix architecture. And now, a lot of people are copying Netflix architecture as a way forward. Um, how many people have heard of Chef? How many people have heard of Puppet? How many people have heard of CF Engine? You have no Chef and Puppet without Mark Burgess. He was a physics professor that inherited, um, the, oh, by the way, you got to manage, he actually transferred over to be a CS professor. And they told him, oh, by the way, since you're now a CS professor, that data center thing, you own it. And what does a scientist do? He basically figures out how to do, solve the problem with science. And he basically invented this genre of infrastructure as code, convergence in infrastructure, uh, desired state infrastructure, all that stuff, right? He's written an incredible book about that really is a compendium about the way our industry thinks, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. Um, it's, um, it's a, it, he's, um, so just as a side effect, since I'm here, um, he's also the author of Promise Theory, which, by the way, that evil Dvorkin character is a big fan of, um, who was the, uh, one of the main architects of um, ACI, all that good stuff you guys are doing. Um, they have implemented not the CF Engine implementation of Promise Theory, but their own Promise Theory implementation. So Promise Theory is alive and well in Cisco, and this is the author's basically long book about um, our industry and how we should think about complexity. And then I. Just as I was coming in, I heard somebody propose a UX design, lean um, presentation. And I will tell you, that book by Jeff Sussner is the best book I read in the last two years called Designing Delivery. Um, he just nails it. He's a UX. He's a complex. He basically did, like, 15, 20, 15 years ago, he was a QA at Apple. Right? That's how he kind of started his career. This is an amazing, if you are thinking about services, UX, not in the how the GUI looks, but lean UX. Um, if you want to understand complexity and how those marry, this is the book. He, he, he describes uh, cybernetics. He's got our whole industry talking about cybernetics now. Um, it's a really, really good book. So I, this is kind of state of union for me in terms of complexity. There's obviously, there's lots more books that I could list here. I don't use Kinevin. How many people heard of Kinevin? Fair amount. Um, I, I have not actually personally found a really good use for it, although I know that it's absolutely useful. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, some of the people I know work with 
are, are big on this. I think it's worth mentioning to explore. It's a framework for understanding complexity. Uh, you break actually um, all things into five quadrants. The four that you see in the middle one is a transitioning quadrant. Um, and just in short, it's, it's kind of understanding what um, quadrant you should be in for a particular solution or situation. And some things are obvious, which in other words, it's, you sense it, you categorize it, bang. They're like the known things that, you, that happen. Some things are a little more complicated in that like you can basically sense it, um, but you, it's not as clear. It's like unknown knowns, they call it. Again, this is like the three-minute version of something that is a, a weak class. But uh, where it gets really interesting is start thinking about things about that are complex, these emergent things, things that happen. We start about, you know, we start building infrastructure that's hundred. You know, if if a large infrastructure today is a hundred thousand, three hundred thousand servers, think about where a large infrastructure with containers might be in three years, right? Could be billions, right? Um, so we start thinking about like emergence, like this. Some of the desired state stuff doesn't really make sense. That's why promise theory is interesting. And then we get to chaotic, which is basically unknown knowns, and that is, that's ultimately, you fix it first, then you try to figure out what happened. There are certain things you just, you, you can't step back, and you know, I tried to explain this to my son, and I was like, you know, a baby's about to touch a stove, which is a horrible way to describe something, but, but like, you don't like, oh, let's see, uh, what, let me look at the historical record on this, right? Like, shh, get away from there. Right? So, so in general, I, 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 when we're talking about complexity, I think, com and, and actually, interesting enough is, um, what I didn't do, well, what happened here? Hold on. Oh, um, it's well, too far back. But Dave Zwieback actually um, teaches, a, he has a really, you want to bring a, another person in next time, bring Dave Zwieback in. He does these one-day um, blameless postmortem workshops. And he, and he includes um, Kenevin in that process. Uh, and then finally, empathy. Um, so Jeff Sosna, who wrote that book, I, I said that was an excellent book. Um, 2014, he wrote this uh, Empathy, the Essence of DevOps. And uh, he said, basically, DevOps is empathy. And at first, I'm like, yeah, really? But yeah, I mean, he's right. Um, and, and it really is stuck, right? And, and um, you know, when we think about, uh, I've been working for three years with Gene and a couple other people on this DevOps cookbook. And, um, you know, it's taken a long time to finish it. Um, but, like, in that book, we, I, I've read a whole chapter on a thing called Embedded Engineers. Um, you know, how do you get people? John, how do I do this? Like, well, you know, an early hack is try to get embedded engineers get take. Um, typically, a classic example is you take an ops person and put them in dev. Uh, there's all variants of this, but that was one of some of the original models that people used. Um, blameless postmortems, right? Um, hopefully, you're covering some of these topics in the open spaces, right? Thinking about it, it all goes back to safety, right? Being in a safe, feeling safe about what you do, um, you know, and, and it, you know, we don't get into a postmortem and start talking about who's not here. Oh, Bob's not here. It was Bob's fault. Okay, check mark done. Uh, right? <laughs> hey, like that's not what it's all about. There's a guy named Jody Mulkey. He used to work in shops. He was CIO. So he would say, you know, we get in the boardroom, John. He says the problem is the enemy. Right? Um, so, um, you know, a safety culture. Right? I mean, you. Um, Sydney Decker's written a couple of books on this. Um, I did my other slide deck that I gave yesterday. I show a picture of um, that Gene sent me a while back. Is a woman on the line at Toyota, and this Andon cord. And so in Toyota line, anybody could pull this thing called the Andon cord, and it would actually stop production. And there's two interesting things about that. One is if you pull, in general, although. Uh, some of these companies have <laughs> kind of got off the wagon. But in general, the model was, and think about this as, as a way to run your business, that if you pull that cord and you stop the line, which is a big deal, and even if it, you thought it was a crack and it was really a fly, you got congratulated for doing it. Like you didn't get yelled at. Right? And you knew the flow was actually going to basically, it was going to get fixed. You weren't going to like, you know, if I pull this cord and it stops, I'm going to have to wait here 20 minutes. I mean, there was a whole model of safety culture and, and inclusion and the way people thought, right? So, so all that are some of the things. So I like the ICE. I, I think it's a good way um, of thinking about um, DevOps.
And, and, and though I don't see it really as a feedback loop, I would say empathy is, and this is explained well in, in um, Dave Zwieback's article, empathy is kind of a parent of both inclusion and complexity. In the, um, there's this thing called the Westrom model, and this is where I need my speaker notes, <laughs> but um, no big deal. I think it's Rob Westrom. What? Rod Westrom, thank you. Yeah, who, know, who said that? Oh, he's reading my notes. Huh? I thought it was somebody in the audience. Hey. <laughs> um, it, we actually, or we, it, it's in the DevOps survey. So if you see the DevOps survey, we have all, this chart. Kind of not, a little bit reworded. But it, um, this Western model talks about pathological, bureaucratic, and generative cultures. And if you read them, you, you, you can get the whole, you know, um, you know um, information is hidden for a pathological, messages are shot. Uh, responsibility is shirked, bridging is discouraged, failure is covered up, you know, and, and bureaucratic, it's information may be ignored, messages are, yeah, yeah, uh, responsibilities. And then if we look at generative right, uh, information is actively sought, uh, messages are trained, um, responsibilities are shared, bridging is worth, failure causes inquiry, not blame. Um, you know, how many people have read Eric Reese's Lean Startup book? Yeah, it's another good book. In fact, most universities now, this is the model they're teaching young kids to uh, think about entrepreneurs. And in there, he, he, he describes the uh, whole chapter on the five whys. And there's a great story on the five whys there where he says, um, you know, the five whys is you, you, gotta, you ask some, five is just a, a placeholder number. But I think in the example that he used, he says that, um, you know, system went down. Okay, why? Well, it was some bad code that looped. Okay, why? Well, it was some it was some programmer named Bob. Okay, what did why Bob? Well, he basically didn't f he didn't follow the standard guidelines for putting code in production. He you know there was some I actually met a guy one day that told me that he could write code that could never loop. I'm like yeah okay good. Um, if you've ever written real code, you know that's absolutely not true. Um, but so, but Bob didn't understand the guidelines of things that were supposed to protect new developers. Okay, why did Bob do that? Well, we cut back on training new developers to every other month. And so Bob just came in the day after what should have been, so he had to wait almost two months to get trained. Right? And he would have learned how to use some additional methods that would have protected the production environment. Right? So, um, so for those of you who haven't read the Phoenix Project, I would personally recommend, although it's not my budget, whoever's paying for this, go ahead and buy this book for everybody in this room. Uh, and, and, and I mean it, I mean like I, I, you know, I can tell you that you will read this book. I, so here's, I love this book. This was a 10 year labor of love by Gene. I met him like six years into this labor of love. Got to get involved in parts of it. Um, we, we, we're writing a prescriptive version of this. Target right now, I got a slide later. Target right now is actually um, one of the most interesting DevOps commercial legacy companies on the planet right now. They've taken somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15,000 square feet in their headquarters up in Brooklyn, uh, Minnesota. And um, they call it the DevOps Dojo. They've got some great presentations online about this. I got to visit them uh, about two months ago, spent a day with them. They bring people in through, so they started like this. Then they got a, like a room like this to call the dojo. They started bringing, the walls are filled with posters that they've done like that, but about minimal viable product, about um, Kanban, about um, Pivot, about all these concepts. And um, they bring development organizations into this dojo and they immerse them in a new way of thinking and process. Now they have like a 15,000 square foot area that senior management has basically said, yes, let's go with this. And there is a waiting list to get into this dojo, to basically do any development project that's going on. I mean, still they're scratching the service. They run, in, they run like their fourth internal DevOps days. They had 400 people at their last one. And the only reason they don't have 1,000 is they have to purposely throttle it. Um, I asked the senior architect, um, Ross Clanton, Clanton what was the light bulb? I was hoping he was going to say DevOps Cafe, but he didn't. He said, what was the light bulb 
for you to do DevOps at Gene's book. Flat out. It's that simple. To me, that's enough. You know, I, I could recommend this book all day long. When I watch what's going on at Target and, and, the, and the architect, he was the lead enterprise architect before they tapped him to figure out how to fix the infrastructure problem. Um, I think, um, you know, so, um, you know, we talk about empathy, I think burnout. Um, I, I wrote this blog article about seven months ago. Um, it was about a young um, DevOps part of our community in LA that committed suicide. I, it, it, tore me apart because I knew the kid. I was caught off guard about it. I wrote this blog article. It's just, I've got to get this off my chest. Gene was nice enough to let me put it on, on the IT Revolution blog, where I sometimes blog other things. And the reaction was insane. It was, I got like 100 emails within two days. Industry leaders, young kids, giving me their four page like struggles that they've had. And we need to think about this. Um, I, I've done a fair amount of presentations on this. Velocity now has burnout panels. Interop even had a burnout panel. Um, um, you know, I love that our industry is taking this serious because this is a tough industry. You know, they think, uh, um, actually Josh Corman did, um, they did an IT sec burnout survey about two years ago. They only got 800 people to respond, but they found out some phenomenal things about, you know, IT security people and burnout, and they, the reason they did it, Ross said they were tired of watching their brethren and sister die. Um, you know, we're gonna try to do one for just DevOps in general, see if we can't get the same type of numbers that they're getting for the other survey, like 20,000 people. Because the thing that you find out that when there's an MBI, it's called a mouse burnout index. The burnout index of ITSEC people were basically comparable to police officers, all the highest, highest stress level industries. And nobody even knows that. I go, isn't that the IT person down the street? What do they got to worry about? They make a ton of money. Anyway. All right, so the DevOps survey in 2014, I said that was the first one that we had 10,000 people that responded to it. Um, it was good because it was stuff that we knew, we just didn't have data. We could shout and scream to the highest mountain, people say, yes, yeah, so you say. And for the first time, we actually had data to show no, wait a minute. We, you know, and you could say, well, it's an echo chamber. It's 10,000 people. Uh, the way you took the surveys, you had to come into the Puppet Labs website, right? Like, okay, I'll buy all that. But it was data, and it proved out some of the things that we knew. You know, that job satisfaction is a key indicator to organizational performance. Um, IT performance is a competitive advantage. I've been saying this forever. Um, I'm not the only one saying it, but um, it was back to Jesse's, you know, tell to startups. Um, Organizational culture is one of the strongest predictors of IT performance. Right from the set, chief characteristics found in high performance, high trust organizations, cross-functional collaboration, shared responsibilities, and learning organizations. Those are the things that came out loud and clear. It's in the 2014 survey. Um, it, you can download it. You have to register. But so in 2000, so one of a couple other things we found out in the 2014. Before I get to that circle, so there are some things about DevOps that are that that would say that they're these counterintuitive things that you've got to get over. You try to sell DevOps, right? You get it, you get a light bulb, and then you try to sell it to somebody who has no clue, and they're like, Eesh, wait a minute. I'm going to put work and process on my people who are working 80 hour weeks. You don't like that idea. Uh, by the way, I'm going to ask you not to do these six month waterfall things, and I want you to just continuously, every time somebody makes a line of code to change, push it into production. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, <laughs> what, what is this guy doing? Right, but, but there's a ton of data out there and great stories about it works. Um, Jim Benson's Personal Kanban is a great book to explain that whole work in process and adding Slack, which is a direct derivative of Elliot Goldratt's theory of constraints. By the way, Kanban for software was, was coined or implemented first by a person named David J. Anderson. And David J. Anderson was reading the goal by Elliot Gorat on a plane ride, trying to figure out how to do, and he knew lean, he knew the Toyota Parks and System Kanban for manufacturing systems, put the two together, invented Kanban for software. Um, the, um, so the, that whole model of work and process. But the other one is this continuously deliver. Like people say, oh, 10 deploys a day, 100 deploys a day. That ain't gonna work here. Um, what we found in the survey is that um, as Gene says, um, per, you know, people that are, per, um, what does he call it? Um, 
not productive, but um, all right. There, there are people that are um, let's say productive and non-productive, or but they're um, darn it, I can't think of the word he uses. But the point is, there are certain high performance, high performance versus low performance. So, and, and again, there's some bias here, right? Like I'm not trying to say this is 100% statistically accurate, but but he would say that what we found out in that 2014 survey that people who were high performers um, who deployed 30x more times than the low performers or uh, uh, um, were found out and, and their deployment lead time was 200x. That means how quick can you get from a whiteboard to making money? Their mean time to recover, which is another thing we love to talk about in DevOps, was 40x times the low performers. So people who produce software 30x more were basically 40x, 48x better at recovery and three times more uh, better at their overall success for delivering, right? which is, just blows everything away about the, the argument of, oh, John, we did that. In 2015, they're off the chart, 168 times more um, and 68. And here's the thing, right? There's a book now by, um, I can't think of his name. It's on IT Revolution. It's what HP found out about laser delivery, where they did a continuous delivery model. Um, if you read anything by Eric Ries, um, you'll, you'll, you can understand why this model works. It works. Um, there's enough data now to prove that this is a working model. You are better at delivering. You will fix bugs faster by continually iterating than you will waiting six months to deliver a monstrous infrastructure that you spend the next three months trying to debug. Um, there's some more data in the DevOps survey. It, it, again, it, it's, um, it, it just talks about all the, uh, the kind of how to generate a culture. I definitely recommend reading this whole survey. Actually, two, three, four. And finally, ending up here, I know I'm probably gone quite long, but we're, uh, we're ending up. Um, I think the DevOps in the enterprises is, is really interesting. Early days of DevOps, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, is like, I knew this had to be a good thing for the enterprise, um, and, but I waited and I waited and I waited. And then um, about a year and a half ago, Ross Clanton and Heather Mickman showed up at this DevOps um, Minnesota and they did this presentation. Uh, Heather runs development and architecture and APIs. She owns basically targets APIs. And, and Ross was the person who was an EA who is told to become an ops per person. And they did this presentation about how they do DevOps. And if you watch their presentations over the year and a half, they don't come out and say, hey, we did DevOps, and everything was excellent. It was like, we did DevOps, and we got beat up. And in fact, at one presentation after this, they talked about how they stopped using the word DevOps. Right? Um, and, and, and now I, I talk about their dojo, right? Like, it, it's, it, this is a great story. But here's the thing. Last year, 2014, we ran the first DevOps Enterprise Summit. And I always hear people say that in the enterprise, you have to do DevOps differently. You know, you web scale folk, eh, you know. It's so easy for you, yeah. It was so easy for Facebook to get to a billion users, yeah. Um, it's not easy. It's different, but it's not easy. It's not easy anywhere. And, but, so this whole argument, I had to do it different, and, and you know, God bless Damon, because I try to stay out of Twitter fights, but he's all day long. <laughs> trying to fight these things. And I kept saying to Gene and Damon, I'm like, you know what? We'll prove this point when we basically do our CFP and, and DevOps Enterprise Summit with companies. Because like, we're either wrong or right on this. <laughs> and, and so two hundred the first year, 2014, we got 200 submissions, 100 or more vendors. Hey, we do DevOps. Yeah, yeah, sure. Get out of here. Um, the, um, but 100 of them were. Serious companies, Barclays, Disney, Nordstrom, um, PNC, um, Target, just go down the list. It was crazy. Government agencies. And every one of their proposals uh, were basically telling me how they were doing DevOps, and they were doing DevOps using the same principles that Facebook or Twitter or you know, any of the number of web scale companies. Now, was it different? Is it hard? Yes. In, and, and then we had a great lineup, and all those are out there, great videos, great stories. In 2015, um, it, it kind of warmed my heart when I saw, um, not only did we get like now about 150 or 200 
core enterprises talking about how they're doing DevOps and doing DevOps like not, oh, by the way, we need to buy on that culture thing because we're an enterprise. <laughs> That's the argument. Like, yeah, John, you just can't do the C in CAMs in the enterprise. Bullshit, right? Um, and, and, and in 2015, like, like we, had, we increased the numbers, but what really warmed my heart, and the same thing with, with me and Gene were talking about, like, this was so cool, that we had three proposals. One was from IBM um, mainframe, someone I knew back in my assembler mainframe days, uh, this woman who presented how they do DevOps with IBM mainframes. That's kind of cool. But the two that really blew me away was uh, Sherman Williams. Like, wait a minute, Sherman Williams? And they had a paint company down the block? And Western Union. Right? Like, it doesn't get any more legacy than that. Right? So, um, anyway, DevOps Enterprise Summit. We, we, we do all the videos. I think some of you are, folk are going there. Um, it, it's, um, you know, we're trying to build out the enterprise story. Finally, um, Gene um, did this thing in April of this year. We did this two-day thing where he invited like 30 or 40 of us up to Portland to do um, a two-day workshop. Gene did this in security a couple of times. Where he, wanted to, he took some security people a few years back, and he wanted to solve big problems with the right mix of people. So he invited a lot of the speakers, some of the leaders in, in you know, what Gene saw as the leaders of DevOps. There was about 30 or 40 of us. We broke up into five words. He said, these are the five things. And actually, it was from a survey from the DevOps Enterprise. Like, what are the big things? And we called it down to five things. We set up five working groups. Uh, we spent two days, got amazing results. Um, we've been continuing to do um, biweekly updates at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. We're going to publish all this stuff. It's all going to be open. The only reason it's not open right now, it's a work in progress. Um, this is some really, really really good data that like basically in October is going to be, uh, there'll be videos on each one of the group leaders are going to present the findings that we had. Um, it, and if you look at the areas that we're covering, and it's a group, it's a mix of web scale people and it's a mix of enterprise people. You know, the people, the woman who runs Nordstrom's infrastructure, Ross Clanton, Heather, uh, the, the, one of the guys who runs uh, Disney's infrastructure, Jason Cox. So, um, and, um, when I sent out that, hey, uh, anybody want to give me the top three things? Uh, Cameron hated Gartner. Um, I, I've, most of my career, I'm not a fan of Gartner. Um, but Cameron was at the original 2010 DevOps days from Gartner, right? Like he was there before Forrester and all the other ones were there. Um, he's actually been very active in sharing bi directional data between. Gene, myself, Patrick, Damon, a few, about four or five other people. In other words, he says, hey, we're going to do this Gartner thing. Um, can you guys share any stuff? He gives us attribution. He shares stuff with me. And when I sent this out, he sent this to me. And I thought it was interesting that like, as of July 2015, DevOps is at the peak of inflated expectations. Hey, right? So if you understand that kind of, uh, um, I asked him, that, has there ever been um, a technology that missed the trough of disillusion? Right? So, Maybe, no. Um, we're in a dangerous place, right? Like, um, you know, th there's a lot of vendors that are basically trying to really swim in on this DevOps thing. Again, I think you guys are doing a great job, honestly. And not just because I'm here and like, oh, I mean, the truth of the matter is, I know that what you've been working on this from a, ground, a grassroots perspective for a couple years now, right? Uh, you're trying to solve it the right way. Um, but not all vendors are doing that. C8. <coughs> uh, wait. Uh. Um, <laughs> what did you say? No, you can't say. I should have caught it quicker. Anyway, I probably could guess. Um, yeah. Oh, and then I said, oh, yeah, technology. Um, I won't. Um, I, I, I think a lot about I, I I know I coined this. I, I defy anybody to tell me I didn't coin it. I didn't coin immutable infrastructure, but I have coined this concept of immutable delivery. delivery. When I first, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, the um, so Netflix about I don't know a couple, few, three years ago or so, wrote um, an article called "Building Infrastructure with Legos" or something to that effect, right? Um, and it was the first time I ever saw somebody really talk about immutable infrastructure. And Martin Fowler, if you Google uh, immutable infrastructure, Martin Fowler's done some good write-ups. In fact, you just 
Google immutable infrastructure, you'll find a fair amount of good reading on it. Um, and um, the, um, so immutable infrastructure, in short, is a model of delivery where you never change production. You're, you're kind of always rolling forward. You know, I have another slide in one of my other presentations, no crud for infrastructure. You never create, update, replace, or delete um, data in an infrastructure. And, and, and Netflix model was the classic, uh, they used Amazon AMIs, the Amazon indexes, or not, in, in images, indexes, um, images. And um, it was interesting, when they first came out with that, I was at Chef, right? And, um, and everybody, Chef and Public, like, you can't do this. Image sprawl, it's going to be a disaster, right? Like, and the truth of the matter is, they were doing it right. Like the beauty, there's always been this um, debate of what they call um, bake versus fry. And, uh, you know, and bake is the, the classic, you know, you, anybody old enough remember ghost, right? You, you create an image. Now the beauty of that kind of image is from a delivery perspective, it's fast, it's clean, you know what's in it, uh, not a lot of entropy, right? Um, the variation of the delivery is clean, so if you delight, if you spray a thousand of these, pretty sure that there's going to be minimal variation. Um, the negative of that is if you're not really good at cataloging and building and reading the artifacts, you have this ridiculous image sprawl and you don't know where anything is at any given time. What Amazon, uh, not, uh, what Netflix did is created that as part of the delivery pipeline. So they actually built AMIs and the final resting place for those was in an artifact refactory which basically was the replacement for their jars and all that stuff, right? And so at delivery time, you pulled the latest and greatest version of infrastructure. For everything. For everything. And it was by definition immutable in that, like when you wanted to rebuild, you just pulled and, I mean, there was service discovery for how do you converge stuff and stuff like that. But in general, in general principle, immutable is that you are not purposely changing anything of the infrastructure. Uh, um, you know, in databases, mileage varies, right? But, but in general, you don't change anything in the infrastructure. You're always kind of rolling forward. When you start thinking about Docker, and you start thinking about how you, developers will build binary artifacts on their laptop, you know, and, and, and it becomes immutable right from the laptop. Right? You run a virtual box, you might be running Vagrant, and you're basically testing out a service stack. You might be a microservices type architecture. You pull your service as a container image. You pull the four other ones that you interact with. You do some, a fair amount of testing on that, those artifacts. Um, in fact, there's a great presentation by Gilt at DockerCon 2014 where um, all they do, and they talk about immutable delivery, they set a metafile up with the binary artifacts. If that goes green through the whole process, the pipeline, the bits that are running on a laptop are the same bits that are running in production. And if you've ever heard the concept of a developer wearing a pager, like they built it, they own the infrastructure, the ops people own the architecture that supports that, life is pretty clean. Um, the reason I call it immutable delivery is it starts from the developer from a delivery perspective. It, and I think that's the Docker. I've got a three-part article on the doc, a three-part blog article on the Docker blog where I go through each step, I just call it Docker in the three ways of DevOps. And, um, and it explains uh, in, in a gory detail, that, again, that Gilt presentation. Gilt is actually kind of a darling child of microservices. They went through like three very revisions of their infrastructure. They now claim they have like 3,000 services defined in a microservice architecture. Um, anyway, so, um, but here's the thing. I, another presentation I've done quite a few times this year um, it's called, uh, I called it uh, the guns, germs, and microservices. If you ever read um, uh, Jared Diamond's um, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Anybody read that? Yeah. It, 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 so he does this kind of why, what's happened over 10,000 years. Um, I took that theme and I used it for a Docker, Creative Gravity, and Microservices. Um, and I, I say that um, containers, or Docker in specific, is a killer app for microservices. It's like, oh, you know, SOA was just waiting for somebody to help fix this, right? And <laughs> time aligned. Um, and then there's this concept of data gravity. If you really want to know more about it, datagravity.org. Um, it's an interesting concept. We moved compute to, uh, uh, we used to move data to compute. 
we're going to get to a world where moving data is not going to be an option <laughs> for lots of different things. So we start moving compute to data. Think about that time to live of compute. Like you might spray thousands of compute here. And I, I call it a, 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 a kind of a macro um, Hadoop, or macro MapReduce, if you will. It's not really MapReduce, but it's a model where you might aggregate data here. A friend of mine, James Arcot, who actually worked, used to work for Cisco, um, he used to call, he said this thing um, about five years ago about um, follow the law. Imagine a world you, 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 instead of moving data around and worrying about compliance, compute here, compute here, compute here. You don't really worry about governance and, and uh, you know, and you kind of aggregate up. So a lot, a lot of, again, I think the best thing I do is these things are interesting. You can uh, tweet me. I do have a list. I'll turn this over. Uh, this is Adrian's um, Faster, Cheaper, Safer. I always end with this slide. Um, if you, um, if you liked anything I talked about, certainly about safety culture or infrastructure, I would definitely recommend trying to seek out anything that uh, Adrian has presented over the last couple of years. Uh, it's, he's pretty amazing. These are the people that helped me when I did that kind of, hey, can anybody help me with the, give me your top three. And these are people that responded. Gene and Bridget, Courtney runs O'Reilly, Dave Zulibrak up there. I definitely uh, recommend bringing him in. Um, Cameron, so, and that's a list of, I think, all of the things I referenced in this presentation. Anyway, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm John Willis at Docker.com. Thanks a lot. So I want to give uh, people a little time for questions, maybe field maybe three or four questions before we break for lunch. So any questions for John? Yeah. This, this is just from the project manager guy. What, can you give me a short explanation of what a container is? Oh, OK. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so a container is um, it's a new form of compute. Well, it's not a new form. It's been around for a while. It's been commoditized such that most people now think it's a new form of compute. And, and so um, and what it is is a, um, an implementation it's, it's loosely speaking, it's a virtualization pattern where the compute is a Linux process. It's not a, it's not a hypervisor based, it's a hypervisorless version of compute. So there is this thing that's been around forever called Linux uh, containers. In fact, prior to that, right, Solera zones. Um, and, the, um, what, and, and Docker has been solely responsible for this rejuvenation and commoditization of this. Uh, you could argue there might be other solutions now that are compatible, but you can't deny that Docker has defined this industry uh, within the last two years, such that they've completely made that a commoditized way of delivering compute at a process level. So from a developer and application standpoint, it looks like a main, uh, not main, it looks like, um, it looks like a, a bare metal compute or a virtual, like virtual compute looks like a bare metal. This process looks like a virtual, which looks like a main. So you, for the most part, there are some idiosyncrasies of delivery and things you, have, you need to be aware of. But in general, developers now can build compute basically on Linux processes that behave like virtual compute. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and, and the thing that makes it really interesting is, you know, somebody asked about the uh, instantiation time. Because it is a Linux process, instantiation time is like 500 milliseconds. Docker has added um, a little other secret source like uh, copy on write file systems. To, so you have this now artifact that you can deliver binary images that have everything in it, the middleware, the OS, and the application. The application developer can do that at their laptop and deliver that thing. I would say that um, this is actually three slides on another presentation. That's what I'm going on because so there might be other people in the room. I would say Java lied. Java said build once, run anywhere. But the truth of the matter is, depending on the JRE, depending on the uh, operating system framework, depending on what your OpX availability is, right? Like, this Docker promise is not a lie. You literally can build a binary artifact on your laptop running something like VirtualBox, and you can deliver that to bare metal, GCE, Amazon, Azure, um, you name it, um, and it will run bit for bit the same. Um, Not you. you. He's a troublemaker. 
Can you comment on uh, how this revolution affects us as as individuals with our personal productivity software? You know, we're, all, we're either running Mac or Windows, and we have different Windows. But I know uh, a f few of the guys who are way into Docker and been there for years. I watched one guy, he was making a point of running up his Excel in one Docker container. He was running up other stuff in another Docker container. So I'm asking, on the level of personal productivity, do you see this revolution coming into our, our own personal lives? Yeah, it's funny you should ask. So um, in my Docker and the Three Ways of DevOps, right, I have the final slide I talk about two stories. And one is worth mentioning, since you asked. Um, Capital One has built this thing called the Analytics Garage, all based on Docker. And it's uh, DockerCon 2015, Capital One. You'll, you'll see the video. It's amazing. Um, they, they created this thing called the Container as a Service. So this is kind of what a lot of people are building now. It's like think about a marketplace of containers, right? Container as a Service. But here's the thing. Capital One actually um, does a lot of data science. In fact, I don't know which banks are winning or losing. I just go by anecdotal data. But I do know that one of the places that Capital One has been very successful is broad stroke lending. Uh, and, they've, and, and the reason is they've used data science. Because entrepreneurs like me, I don't have the greatest FICO score. There have been times in my life where I didn't get paid for three or four months. All right? and, um, and like that refrigerator company that complains, dings me for 10 years. Right? So the point is, a lot of people who lend money go exclusively on FICO score. Capital One made this conscious decision a while back to say, you know what? That's kind of silly. There's a lot of data out there. And I can figure out, like, I've had two successful exits in the last three years. I'm not bragging, but I'm doing all right. <laughs> like, I'm a good bet on lending right now. Right? Like, Capital One can figure that out. And they do it through data science. Well, here's the problem with data science in a large enterprise. Or in just anywhere. But say you've got 100 data scientists in your company. You've got some data. And the, the amount of tools that you could possibly use, and, and if you talk to, I'm trying to become, if I have another career, I've got four now. This will be my fifth. My next career might be in data science if I live long enough. Um, the, um, I've been talking to a lot of data scientists. And one of the things you'll hear over and over, the hardest part is not the tools. It's how to munge the data, how to get into the mind of the data, how to use the data in a way. And the thing that they found was, and, and this is just common knowledge, that data and tools are not obvious. And so the, the classic non-garage analytic garage model was, Literally, if you had data, you would say, well, I think if I use Hadoop, Spark, and this type of file system, it might work. But I wonder what would happen if I use Python R and R Python and this, or you know, whatever foray of like, different combinations. And the ability for an enterprise to deliver that kind of infrastructure for a data science to be able to test that data five ways, six ways, which, you know, which I would love to do, it just wasn't feasible. You pick one. So the Analytics Garage, the data scientists now can run through five or six different variants. They built container-based, about 10 or 15 of the different variants that they use. And now a data science can whip through all those with small sets of data to figure out what's the best way to actually figure out data. On a personal level, um, the reason I'm excited about data science is I've got a 6-year-old and I've got a 12-year-old. My 6-year-old is so not like me, reads every night, great study habits. Um, you know, like we are Georgia Tech bound, um, and my but my 12 year old problems there, like and so I've been trying to hack my 12 year old for quite a while. Coding, nah, dad, not interesting. Loves sports. And any given day he would rattle off the top 10 this, but the five that do this, the eight that don't do that. And I realized um, there's a great amount of data science in baseball. So I basically had this mission to teach him R. And we've been working on it. In fact, he's done some keynotes on this. Uh, not keynotes, uh, Ignite talks on this. And so accidentally through this process of teaching him R and learning data science. Now, actually, the, the head fake is I'm now really interested in learning data science. But, but I, I decided to put this database uh, called, there's something called Save Metrics. Long story short, it's, it's a lot of data about baseball. It's a great way to le learn data science, by the way. Um, there's a package out there that has every statistic from every baseball player and team going back to 1871. I figured, you know what, let's just throw this in a Docker container. Um, and then the net result of that is, now it doesn't take 500 milliseconds to instantiate. <laughs> it takes about four seconds. That's okay. I could be anywhere on the planet, 
and I can basically pull this package down and I can basically give you incredible amount of insight to anything that's happened in baseball since 2014 is the last year, all the way back to 1871. So yeah, this container thing is, if that's just one glimpse have how it can fit. Imagine people who want to do data science on all other sorts of things, or, or just anything that's good. Oh, I, I lied. There was one more quick one, and I know we should get to lunch. But um, there was, um, when I started soccer playing, which was this SDN for Liberty, we had a couple of people that were doing networking for Docker, and they were doing it all wrong. <laughs> they, they were literally using, uh, you know, I used to joke that some of our competitors were using uh, TCP dump for overlays, um, right? And you know, we were using open V switch in the data plane, right? Like so, but um, once we got acquired Docker, I had to play nice with those people, right? And so one of the ones that came out with this really nice interface, and under normal conditions, I'd be like, you know what? I don't really like those guys. I'm not gonna test their new cool shiny thing, except that I saw it was in a container. And literally in four minutes, it was some web interface that actually shows a complete topology of all your containers. I actually had about 30 containers running on three systems at the time. So I'm like, you know what? I fired this up and I had a really good knowledge of where this product sat and it was enough for me to want to further explore. And because I knew that I could fire it up in a container and I knew it was gonna take a couple of minutes to do that, I had hoped that that was the model. And so I think it changes in every way I, I think it will change the way we look at compute. There's things like unikernel. I mean, we're going to be less, you know, uh, Docker has taken the development and bypassed the infrastructure folk, which is a good thing. Right? I, I think in general, we're moving to a world where just general consumers will be able to do exotic compute and bypass the infrastructure. All right. Thanks a lot, John. I think at this point we need to wrap it up and get to lunch, but, yeah. but everybody. <laughs>